The ferocious Mongol regime that had conquered Korea and China over the last century was, again, looking to expand its empire. Its leader, the legendary Kublai Khan, wrote to the Japanese emperor informing him that the Mongols expected to receive tributes and taxes from Japan. Khan received no response. Enraged, the Mongol ruler dispatched a fleet of warships to teach the obstinate provincials a lesson. It's the only time between the early 500s and the 20th century that Japan was invaded by a foreign power and one of only two times that Japan, the Japanese warriors actually fought a foreign enemy. The Mongol fleet set out from the Korean peninsula with hundreds of ships and several thousand men. They landed at Hakata Bay on Japan's southernmost main island. The samurai warriors sent to face them were in for a rude awakening. They confronted a very different form of battle. The samurai method of fighting during this period was somewhat ritualized and consisted primarily of mounted archery duels. Proud opponents on horseback would square off in bouts of individual combat. The Mongols, having arrived by ship, had no horses and fought on foot, many with swords and spears. They simply formed themselves into tight, powerful units and attacked. And in this battle, many of them ruthlessly speared the samurai horses. For added shock effect, they even made use of explosive devices filled with gunpowder. So these sounds made the samurai horses panic. And so samurai had to withdraw to the uh, capital in Kyushu. At the end of the day, the Mongols held the battlefield, but apparently they didn't know they had won. Perhaps believing the samurai would be reinforced and attacked that night, the Mongols suddenly pulled back to their ships and set sail. For now, at least, the samurai were safe. However, they feared it could happen again, so they immediately took preventative measures. The Kamakura government uh, basically constructed walls along every beach where sizable forces could land. And these walls that could extend for miles, they'd be about sometimes several feet high, several feet wide, and they'd be about 20 feet behind the beaches. A good thing, because the Mongols came back. Seven years later, Kublai Khan put together an armada of several thousand ships and tens of thousands of men. The wall building paid off. This second Mongol fleet was forced to remain afloat for weeks, depleting food and water supplies, while they looked for a suitable place to land. Meanwhile, the Japanese readied themselves for a horrendous battle. They prepared to fight, and they prayed. Coincidentally, the prayer must have worked, because nature soon intervened. A storm of the century swept in and obliterated hundreds of Mongol ships. There was a typhoon. It did hit, and it did destroy one whole fleet. I just say it, the typhoon was the end point of a defeat long in the making. That's how I look at it. It didn't cause the defeat. It just finalized the defeat. This typhoon is the reason we have the phrase kamikaze today. The samurai who defended against the Mongols had prayed for assistance from their Shinto deities. Shinto is roughly a mixture of ancestor and nature worship. The warriors believed that the gods delivered the storm, so they called it kamikaze, which means divine wind. To keep the gods on their side, since they fully expected the Mongols to try again, both the imperial court and the shogunal government in Kamakura ordered an ongoing series of prayer rituals at Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples across the land. To help in the effort, they also tried to harness another perceived form of spiritual power. For the samurai, the importance of the sword cannot be overstated. Swords had long been thought to possess unique spiritual qualities. Accordingly, master swordsmiths were commissioned to make special blades for shrines and temples as tokens of good luck. The process of making the sword, it's not simply pounding out the metal. It was actually a religious experience as well. Often we hear about smiths who, who meditate, who pray, who recite sutras while they're making the sword. I have one particular sword. He meditated for 100 days underneath a waterfall in the freezing winter before making a sword. 
So the idea was to purify not only his technique, but his mind, body, and soul. And that was all put into the process of making each blade. This is, this is a great tradition, really fascinating. Japanese swords before the 7th century were straight-bladed, double-edged weapons. The straightness of the blade made them better suited for thrusting than slashing. When the sword hits something, there is an impact. With the straight-edged sword, that impact comes straight to the hand. But the design of the arched sword makes the impact less. Another benefit of a curved sword is that it is easier to draw from its scabbard when worn at the waist. To take advantage of these benefits, over time, swords made in Japan gradually took on more and more blade curvature. The sword took its final shape in the mid to late 7th century. This is the curved single-edge blade. From this time, maybe we can count over 40,000 smiths throughout the history of Japanese sword making up to the present day. Perhaps the most renowned swordsmith of all time was a man named Masamune. He lived and worked some 750 years ago, right at the time of the end of the second Mongol invasion. He, in fact, was one of the smiths asked to make good luck swords to help prevent the Mongols from returning. It must have worked, because the Mongols never threatened Japan again. Incredibly, Masamune's legacy continues today. Modern swordsmith Yamamura Tsunahiro is the 24th generational descendant in the Masamune line. In a rustic shop in Kamakura, Japan, he and several apprentices still forge masterworks of martial steel in the traditional manner. Working together, the students wield the massive hammers that actually shape the hot steel while the master taps out instructions to guide them. Where I am sitting, in musical terms, is the conductor's chair. And with the hammer in my hand and gestures, I signal where to pound and how fast or slow. Throughout the process, Yamamura occasionally rolls the steel mass in a mound of charred straw ash to add carbon. The amount of carbon a sword blade contains determines its flexibility. By folding and refolding the metal over and over again, we strengthen it. That's the purpose of the process. Boric acid inserted in each fold removes oxygen and prevents rusting between layers. It takes about two weeks to complete the process, a long wait for an eager client. The most frequent clients are collectors also ones who have a specific purpose, or ones that experience something for the first time, something worthy of commemorating, for which they want a sword for protection. That is common as well. For instance, a protection sword for the newly born grandchild or the newly rebuilt home. Those kinds of requests are common. Asked what it means to him when he holds one of his completed and autographed blades in his hands, Yamamura admits to his immense gratification. It is the proof that I'm alive. When I put my name into a sword, it's going to remain there for about a thousand years. And that's proof I lived in this age. Indeed, swords crafted by his famous ancestor of 700 years past are still in private collections today, each one having been passed down through the centuries following the Mongol invasions. As the years progressed, this simple yet elegant form of sidearm would become such a valued instrument of personal protection 
and such an integral component of the warrior identity, it would come to be known